welcome to the Mad Podcast. Let's jump right into it. What's the elevator pitch for Human Loop? Yeah, great question. So, you know, at its core, Human Loop's helping product and engineering teams build reliable applications on top of large language models like GPT-4. So we help them find, manage, and version prompts for these applications, optimize them, and then measure how well they're working. So for example, Duolingo uses us to develop a lot of the prompts behind their AI-focused features. And then Human Loop becomes something like a CMS and both a development environment and a CMS for their AI prompts over time. A lot of companies building LM apps today don't have established workflows for this. Everything's really new. They've got domain experts doing prompt engineering. They've got software engineers who are actually implementing things. It's shared in Slack. It's very hard to evaluate. There isn't an established set of tooling like there is for more traditional, both machine learning and software. And so we're building the pieces that are needed to version, manage, and evaluate these components. Okay, cool. So for people like me, you know, like I do this annual mad landscape where I have a lot of logos, a lot of categories. So like where, where do you put human loop? Are you, are you ML ops? Are you LLM ops? Are you prompt engineering? Are you all of the above? Or maybe there's yeah. maybe this feudal exercise and there's just not enough categories. Some of these categories are somewhat overlapping and also there's a lot emerging. I, I think that I would describe us probably as maybe the first LLM ops or LLM ops company that there was. And over time, we've actually like narrowed our scope as more players have come into the market. We haven't had to do everything. And so there's two pillars that we really focus on. And one is this collaborative development environment where non-technical people, product managers, and domain experts collaborate with the engineers on prompt engineering, coupled very closely to tools for evaluation and monitoring. So those are the two things we're focused on. It's LM ops, I guess, at its core, but those are the pillars. And I think they kind of belong very closely together for many reasons I can go into as we discuss. Okay, great. So what would you say are the specific challenges when evaluating and monitoring LLM? So obviously the, the category of evaluation and monitoring in, in the software world has yielded you know, huge companies like uh, Datadog in particular, but that's one world. Like how is the world of LLM different? What are the specific challenges and opportunities? Yeah. So machine learning differs from traditional software in a couple of key ways. And then generative AI as a kind of subset of machine learning differs even further. So the first transition you go to when you go from kind of traditional code to machine learning is that it's no longer deterministic, right? We're used to, for software engineers, writing a program, you run it, you get the same results each time, you can write a deterministic test, and people are doing performance monitoring with something like Datadog, but they're not expecting that when they run the code each time, they're going to get different outputs. Once you move to the world of machine learning, now it's stochastic, and not only that, but you're now specifying what the program does via a data set and a training process rather than you know deterministically in code. And so evaluation and machine learning focuses on accuracy metrics and things like that. And when we go to LLMs and generative AI, we go one step further where the use cases that people are applying these to are very general and very subjective often. To pick a couple of examples, you know, if you're helping someone draft a sales email um, or you're writing marketing copy, there isn't any longer a kind of ground truth answer that you can compare against for the model to know whether it's correct or not. Even if you're doing uh, question answering, where someone asks the question, there are many, maybe many, many different ways to correctly answer that question with different wordings and different ways of expressing what you're saying. And so some of the challenge comes from the fact that it's so much more subjective and it's stochastic so that it becomes difficult to know, you know what does good look like and then to measure that performance uh, as you, once you're in production. And so... Evaluation is important, I think, for LLMs at three stages, and each of them is challenging in different ways from traditional software. So during development, you have to make a lot of different design decisions. You're choosing between different prompts, different models. People are building retrieval augmented systems, so they have to kind of choose over the different components of an information retrieval system. And so there's this combinatorially large set of different things we're choosing between. And if you can't measure what good is, that it's really easy to just keep changing things and not knowing like, am I getting better? Or am I moving closer to my goal? So during development, being able to have some quantitative feedback on like, what does good look like is very important. Then you deploy to production and now the range of inputs that your users put through the system is really broader than maybe what you could have done during development and testing. And there's often surprises. How do you know that the system is continuing to behave the way you expect it? It's not making things up. It's not saying things that are embarrassing. And it's just giving users a good experience. So kind of there's a monitoring piece that is different to what you can do with traditional monitoring tools. And then finally, there's regression testing, 
which is, okay, OpenAI's model changed, or I did a new fine tune, I changed a prompt, the, the vector database changed, I'm deploying something new, how do I know that it hasn't gotten worse on the core use cases that I care about? And if you don't have good evaluation and monitoring in place, you can't do that either. So those are kind of three areas where it comes up. And for each of those, it's really different traditional software because of the subjectivity and the stochasticity. Mm, great. Okay. So how are you solving the problem? Like maybe taking the three in, in turn, what human look do to address the issue? Yeah. So we provide the ability to get evaluation data, both from human feedback in various ways and also in an automated way. So I maybe take the human feedback version first. And this is actually the, the first version of Human Loop's product started at doing this, which is that because it's very subjective, there's some sense in which the only real ground truth is your customer's satisfaction or opinion of the experience they get out of the product. And so we make it really easy for people to instrument their applications with the ability to capture feedback. So the simplest version of this is things like thumbs up, thumbs down that you might have seen in many applications. You see it in ChatGPT, but people also tend to collect implicit signals of user satisfaction. So the actions that they take after interacting with a particular LLM app. And also if people are able to edit any generated text or generated content, then also capturing those edits can be a very useful signal of how well things are working. And then in the human loop app, we triangulate those sources of feedback back against, okay, what model created it, what inputs created it. And we give product teams the ability to dig into that data, analyze it, understand what's working well and isn't and why. And then critically to also in the same application, take actions to change things, to make them better. So to edit prompts or to fine tune models. So the human feedback component is one big part of it. And that feedback is typically either coming from end users or sometimes it'll come during development from an internal annotation team that maybe later will be switched to, to production feedback. And then we also have the ability to do automated evaluations where here, these are evaluations that are for more conventional metrics than just traditional code. There are some metrics that people still calculate. They want to just measure things like latency, maybe for things where there is a, like there's scores, like things called like Rouge and Blue that measure token overlap with a kind of ground truth test set. So things you would have in a traditional MLOps software, those are available. But then in addition, what you wouldn't normally have is we have model-based evaluations where you actually have another LLM that is defined as an evaluator and reads the inputs and outputs of what's being given to the model and then scores them in a particular way. And a lot of people have been trying to do this. I'd, I'd love to go into a little bit more depth if we have time because I think that there's bad ways and there's good ways to do this. Uh, and we're trying to basically in the app productize it such that you're naturally on guardrails and you set this up in a way that's going to work well. Yeah, let, let, let's do it. Let's uh, double click on this. Uh, yeah. For interesting topic. So, so I, I think when you come about to use a, an LLM as part of the evaluation piece and you're kind of trying to get it to score how well things are working, the danger is you're now adding in a second form of like uncertainty and the noise, you know, the evaluator itself can have some noise in it. And so then you need an evaluator which, to evaluate the evaluator. Exactly. And you know, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so in order to avoid that, we try and put some guardrails and constraints over how you create these. So LLMs are pretty good at answering simple factual questions about inputs and outputs. So for example, if you have a system that's doing question answering, where it first retrieves from a database and then uses that retrieved context to answer the question, if you ask the model, hey, was the final answer, was that based on the retrieved context, yes or no? That's, a, that's an answer that a model will get right very consistently, right? It's a factual question based on very simple reasoning, looking at input and output, and it's Boolean in nature, yes or no. But that gives you a really strong signal. Do I have hallucination problems with my application, for example? And so we restrict people to generating evaluators that either have these like binary yes, no style questions, looking at the inputs and outputs, or we get them to return a numerical score. One of the mistakes that I kind of have seen people do in the past, they'll do things like ask an LLM to rank or compare various outputs. And although this is getting better, there's some evidence to suggest that the order in which you ask the question affects the LLM's output. And so it's very easy to get a kind of biased results. And so we kind of make sure that that doesn't happen. So, you know, being very careful about what we allow users to define as LLM evaluators ensures that they work reliably. Yep. And hopefully not an unfair question because Datadog has built, we know a multi-billion dollar business, but let's assume human loop finds regression or, you know, different results from the same prompt. 
Then what, what can you do as an enterprise? Obviously, yeah. knowing that it's an issue is essential, but is there, is, there, is there a way you can fix that or, or you should just be aware? No, it's, I think this is one of the strongest arguments for why a new set of tools is needed and why using you know existing platforms for monitoring and observability is less productive. And it's because with generative AI, the speed with which you can make interventions is extremely high. And having that in one combined platform is actually one of the powers of this. So you're absolutely right. So within Human Loop, I mentioned we have this kind of interactive environment, both for, for prompt engineering and we also have the ability for people to fine-tune models, which is where you do a little bit of extra training on a new data set. And so what will often happen is people will find a bug. You know, They'll basically like be exploring the, the log data within Human Loop. They'll find an issue. They'll reopen those data points back into that interactive environment where they can now run what-if style analysis. So they can change the prompt or they can change the information retrieval system a little bit and see what the impact was. If they're able to then fix that issue, they then run a regression test. They say, okay, is this new prompt still performing well on what worked before? And if the answer is yes, they can actually promote it straight to development or production from within that system. And so actually a product person or a domain expert who's able to go in and find a bug is also able often to do the intervention right there. And the turnaround time can be sometimes minutes to hours, but it's usually within the same day. And I think that if you don't have a system like this, then your logs typically live in a completely different system. So you find the issue, but now you need to say, okay, which model or which prompt was responsible for this issue? Okay, where is that stored? Okay, it's in code somewhere. Now get the prompt, put it back into some kind of interactive environment, figure out how to change it, and now go through a whole deployment process to get it back in production. That can be really slow and actually it's unnecessarily slow. There, this is an opportunity of LLMs. Before with machine learning, if you wanted to update a model, it was actually quite cumbersome. It required a full retraining run. And so you couldn't have as quick an intervention. But because prompt engineering allows you to intervene really quickly, I think it's very important to have evaluation and observability very closely connected to the prompt engineering tools. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the collaborative aspect around prompts, is it prompt engineering as in engineering inputs to help shape the model's direction in a certain way? Or is it like end user, you know, business user prompts where you have a library of different prompts where you say, well, if you want to get the best result for this marketing query, this is how we do it at Pfizer or Bank of America or, you know, any customer. So it's much more the first one. So people okay. are building an end user facing application and they're trying to customize a very general purpose model to that specific use case. And so... In some ways, it's just like writing code, but the code now happens to be a natural language and is really specifying to the model what you want it to be able to do. If we try and pick a, a concrete example, maybe you're trying to do a summary of a call for a salesperson. Well, the kind of summary you want for a salesperson would be very different for a different audience. And so it's explaining to the model, hey, this is for a salesperson. I would like you to be able to, I don't know, extract the budget and who the decision makers are and what their biggest needs were and when the next stage of actions are. And really, it's getting to the point where prompt engineering is much more like writing the spec of software. It's really just about articulating very clearly what you want the model to do. And that's something that's often best done by product people or domain experts. And so one of the things that I'm most excited about is the extent to which this actually democratizes access to people who are closer to the customer, are closer to product needs, and no longer have to go via engineers to have an impact on the product. In a previous world, they would have maybe written down the spec and discussed it with engineers and an engineer would have done the implementation. But increasingly product managers, domain experts are able to affect product and be involved in product development much more directly. And then on the latter, more like the business users side of things, which thanks for clarifying that is not what you cover, but just out of curiosity, have you observed any kind of best practice around what you've seen customers do? Um, prompts, like people in whatever, marketing or finance or HR, like any way to guide them on how to best use those products in a way that just minimizes issue, or is that still very new territory and people are finding yeah, out? Yeah, we. It's, it's funny, we do have a couple of customers who use Human Loop in that way, because I think that actually the market is missing an appropriate solution. And so they kind of hack what is not built for that for a slightly <laughs> different use case. But we have some customers where actually they have maybe a thousand users who are on Human Loop and where they're saving common prompts and workflows on a per team basis. So they say, okay, here's how you, you know, this is the way that you solve X task with a with an LLM and there's a predefined prompt and they go and they open it up 
they load it, they dump in their data, they run that process. Honestly, I think that it's something that companies are still figuring out and there isn't a very good solution on the market yet. It's something that I would hope ChatGPT Enterprise just solves at some point by, you know, things like their custom GPTs, I think are a step in this direction of allowing people to save workflows and prompts and share them with the team. I haven't seen other good solutions yet. I, I, I'm reasonably confident that it's not well solved because of the fact that I see people kind of using and abusing human loop in this way. Yes, interesting and funny. So you are able to evaluate and monitor all sorts of models, it seems, whether closed source or open source. Yeah, so we're at LLM agnostic. We sit on yeah. top of most of the major players as well as your own models or open source as well. And is that because from a prompt engineering perspective, it doesn't really matter how it's deployed because the way of interacting with the model is through the prompt. So the only thing that matters is what comes out as a response or is there more? Yeah, yeah, more or less, yeah. right? Like yes. the base models are somewhat interchangeable. They have different characteristics. They have slightly different performance abilities. You know, larger models are slower and more expensive. Smaller models are faster, but maybe less good at reasoning tasks. They go through reinforcement enforcement learning by human feedback in different ways. So they almost have different personalities, the different models, but fundamentally the mode of interaction is the same. The challenges around evaluation are the same. And also just many companies want to be able to have the ability to move between them on different use case basis. And so it makes sense to sit on top of all of the different models. You have any uh, lesson learned or like any patterns we see across different types of models in terms of... Yeah, uh... I would say that like it's still the case in terms of like pure like raw performance, GPT-4 and OpenAI's models still have a little bit of an edge over their co near closest competitors. And Tropic's models are also extremely strong. But for, for you know, amongst those closed source APIs, OpenAI's models for tasks that require higher amounts of reasoning are still the best. And so what we see a lot of is people starting with that. It's the fastest to prototype with. It allows them to get a first version built quickly, get it to market, get feedback, validate an idea. But oftentimes the downsides of it, and OpenAI is working on this, is costs and latency. It's a bigger model, it's more expensive, it's very general. And once you do have a specific use case, maybe you don't need the full power of GPT-4 having, you know, once you've developed it. And so a very common pattern is people will build the first version with the most powerful model, and then they will try and fine tune a smaller model for that task. And they'll often use the production data that they generated as the fine tuning data. That might be fine-tuning GPT 3.5 Turbo. It might be fine-tuning an open source model. The other thing that we've been seeing is just that the quality of the open source models that are available is going up very quickly. A year ago, the gap between the best performing open source model and the best closed model was enormous. Now it's still big in tasks that require complex reasoning, but for many tasks, you can get away with a smaller model. And that has the advantage that if you care a lot about privacy or you care a lot about latency, you can run these things locally. And oftentimes they're much smaller. And for those open source models, which one are the best? Is that Llama 2? Is it Falcon? Is that uh, like any, anything you've Llama seen? 2, Llama 2 is still the one that I think has the best overall performance, but there are good smaller models coming out as well. So I think there's been a lot of excitement recently around the Mistral 7B model. Eight. So this 7B being 7 billion parameters, so this is, you know, 10 times smaller than GPT-3 roughly, but still getting similar performance. And so that's one that's quite exciting for being both uh, excellent and small, and also just a very impressive team. Falcon was state of the art when it came out, but I think has been superseded since then. Okay, great. I uh, saw so an answer, something called tools. Did, did we cover that already? Is that, is that, is that, so we talked about prompt engineering, we talked about fine tuning. So we it's haven't, we haven't actually covered tools yet. So, you know, LLMs by default are text in, text out. And so they're limited in what they can do in terms of taking action in the world. And the idea of tools or what OpenAI originally called function calling, and we sort of called it tools. And now I think we, we won the war on the naming because everyone, they, they <laughs> renamed it to tools now as well. But essentially what this is, is that if an LLM wants to take an action in the world, you essentially allow it to do that by exposing a set of APIs. So a set of different programs that the LLM can use. And you say to the model, hey, these are the tools that are available to you. So for example, web browsing might be a tool that's available to the model. And the model then can output a request to that API, which is just a JSON string. So it's just another piece of text. And that JSON string will specify which tool it wants to use, what question it wants to ask of that tool or how it wants to use that tool. That output is then taken, used to run the tool itself, 
So maybe you go and do a web search. The result of the web search is then passed back to the model and the model then uses that output to make an, another decision. And so suddenly you go from a system that's only text in, text out to something that can be action taking and that can actually uh, take advantage of external APIs in the world or do information retrieval. So the, the simplest and most commonly used version of tools, I think, is just retrieval, where a model will decide to use a knowledge database to answer questions factually. But people are pushing the limits of this in very complex ways. I think I saw that you had the founder of Lindy AI on here recently. And you know, Lindy is a great example of this, where they're making very heavy use of agents or you know, LLMs that are able to actually take actions in the world. And this is the way that it's typically achieved. Okay. And so this is one of the areas where you're going as well into monitoring agent chains and to be Yeah. So you can, you could by default monitor an agent into chain just as well as you would a normal single LLM call with a human loop. But you can also in our interactive environment be prototyping with different tools, with agents, with, you know, with chat based models that are able to take action. Okay. So circling back to some of the beginning of the discussion into the where you fit in which categories, what's super interesting for people who are who spend time in the space, not as technical experts, but like people trying to make sense of how it all works together, this explosive pace of innovation and all those new different companies and categories. And each company seems to have its own evolution. And as a result, it's a little, uh, little blurry who does what. So any thought there would be very helpful to in particular. Frameworks like Langchain, where, where does that fit? Are you a competitor? Are you a partner? And then a JGPD enterprise, what OpenAI does in terms of like getting further into the enterprise, same thing is that a competitor, friend, foe? Yeah. So I think at base, you have the foundation model providers, right? So here you would have OpenAI, Cohere, Anthropic, Mistral, whoever else it might be, the open source models, Llama. And then at the other end, you know, the other end of this spectrum maybe is the applications which are the end user facing applications and human loop is kind of a layer that sits in the middle. So we're model agnostic. We have close partnerships and we'd definitely be friends with all of the foundation model providers. We're keen to basically help their customers get to value. LangSmith and LangChain. LangChain is like a orchestration library. So this is basically just a set of utility tools for people who are writing the code around an, an AI application. And it has a whole bunch of helper functions built in that help them get started more quickly. So that wouldn't be sort of directly competitive. There are their Lang Smith product probably has a little bit of overlap with us, but it is not, you know, it has some overlap that is fundamentally, I think, focused more around monitoring chains and agents. And then where I think we are focused is for enterprises who are building LM aspects, where typically there's a lot more collaboration required. This becomes a team sport. And also where the need to have guardrails and evaluation starts to become much more significant because they're operating at a higher level of stakes. And so I think one of the differentiators for us right from the start is that we've been focused you know, on larger companies, on people who, as soon as you're building at the scale of a company, like I'm trying to think of the ones I'm allowed to mention, but we have some very large companies who use us, who are you know, financially regulated, et cetera. For them, being able to have very robust evaluation is just absolutely critical and also they tend to have collaboration needs that are not seen at the smaller end of skinks. So startups and 30, 40 person companies or people who are hacking on the weekend tend to have less needs around collaboration. So that's changed the nature of the products that we've built. Speaking of, of customers, you have some uh, impressive and very recognizable logos on the on the website. So congratulations on, on all of that, the, the early traction. What, what are you learning in terms of uh, who's a good customer? And yeah, what level of sophistication, what, what, what do they need to have before they come to you to. Yeah. So the sweet spot for us is a, a kind of mid-sized enterprise company. So there's a, if they're small startups, you know, maybe fewer than a, a 200 people, then typically they don't care as much about evaluation. They're willing to take more risk in production and, and let things go wrong a little bit. And also collaboration is like less of an issue for them because they're such a small team. They can all sit in the same room together and they can figure it out. On the very large end, once people are hundreds of thousands, we tend to be able to solve problems for them, but the procurement cycles get very long. And so it's not a it's not where we end up focusing. And then within those companies, at this enterprise level, the thing that's a surefire sign that they're going to be a good customer for Human Loop is they've reached the point where they've started actually building. There's a lot of people who have interest in Gen AI. There's a lot of talk, a lot of excitement but a, a smaller subset who have actually put their hands on the keyboard and written some code. 
And the, uh, within that subset, the ones who are best are the ones who have started trying to build some kind of internal tools themselves. So almost everyone who's building an LLM application will hit these problems. They'll need evaluation, they'll need logging, they'll need monitoring, they'll need prompt versioning and management. Like it's not a question of if they need it, it's really a question of do they build it themselves? Do they buy it? Which tool do they buy? But they will need it. And so for us, usually the sweet spot is a head of product from the AI team or someone senior in the engineering side, you know, books a demo with me and they say, hey, we spent the last two months trying to build this. We're realizing it's more complicated than we thought. Actually, we would like to just buy a solution. Can we get a demo? And so it's the people who are problem aware and have started building. That's really when we have the quickest traction. Yep. And they, at this stage, they typically find you in terms of go to market motion, you mostly inbound, bottoms like up. Like 90, 90% inbound. I would say inbound, but sales led. So not bottoms up. Like what we're, like the motion isn't typically that like an individual developer is playing with it and then they buy a license and 10, you know, a few more people join. Yeah. It's usually that like someone sees it within the company, they come, they do a demo, and then they typically buy it for their department because they know that they're going to need a certain number of seats and, and usage and volume. And it makes sense for there to be a unified approach. I think what a lot of companies are worried about is there's kind of lots of different teams just spinning up lots of things in very ad hoc ways and building their own tooling and using spreadsheets and they don't have oversight, they don't have version controls, they don't have role-based access, they're worried about what data people might be putting into the models. So they actually are looking to centralize it and have more standardized processes where teams can learn from each other. And so Human Outloop also becomes that central place where they're storing all their prompts, but they're also actually sharing learnings across teams. Interesting. Are, are you finding yourself doing uh, a lot of uh, evangelizing and education and, I mean, obviously a software company some level of services, at, not in terms of like your strategy as a company, but like a more as a testament to where the market is and like people need a lot of hand holding and help. We do a certain amount of enablement, but I, I don't see it as that different to, to other enterprise software products, right? There's a certain exactly. amount of training and help that's needed to onboard a team of people to a new product, but where there's enough people now in the market who are problem aware that actually we don't need it so much. If you'd asked me the same question six months ago, it was a very different story. But I think we're actually reaching a level of maturity in the market where people know what they want. They've tried to build something. The problems are becoming clear. There's an emerging kind of set of tools that are needed. And typically they come to us knowing more or less what they're looking for. Well, interesting. Anecdotally, are you seeing uh, that evolution into production? I think we've all seen this. It's a lot of talk, a lot of excitement. Some consultants out there are making a lot of money guiding uh, companies towards uh, potential production. But like, are, are you seeing some um, exciting use case in production just yet? Or is that in the making? What's your sense of the reality of the market right now in the enterprise? So we're starting to. It's been a little bit slower to get things to production because there's more like security concerns and legal concerns and just more hoops to jump through. But we're beginning to see it now. A couple of, you know, I, I can't name names for some of these, but like larger financially regulated companies are starting to use these for internal operations. So where they have huge teams of people who are doing a lot of basic document processing and they're able to actually like dramatically accelerate some of those workflows using LLMs. Okay. Very, very cool. So maybe taking a step back from human loop, I'd be curious about your thoughts as a deep industry practitioner on, on, on some you know, some of the key debates in the industry right now. So certainly as we are recording this, so there seems to be a tweet every second on open source, the closed source models and, you know, people that feel very strongly about preserving a very free open ecosystem and others that are more concerned about security risk. Like what, any, any, any thoughts on that debate? Where, where do you land? Just curious. But my natural inclination is always to be in favor of open source, right? Just as a default knee-jerk reaction, we've got so much benefit from open source in general. The software world is built on top of it that, that I always start from a position of optimism about open source. I understand, though, some of the reasons why people have safety concerns around larger models. There is an opportunity for misuse. And I've seen people like Jan LeCun say, oh, but we already have search engines. So like... You know, people can look up with a search engine how to build a bomb or how to, you know, build a bioweapon. Like, why do LLMs make it worse? But I think that really does downplay, like, how much better they are at synthesizing information and explaining steps to you. And there is a dramatic reduction in how hard it is to do certain forms of misuse. 
And that's before we get to the more safety, you know, the safety concerns about AI that actually is misaligned. But to me, the question is like, it's very difficult to know when to, like how to solve this or when to put restrictions in place. People, when GPT-2 came out, they didn't release GPT-2 for fear of misuse concerns. And then GPT-3, and now we're on GPT-4. It would have been really sad for the world, I think, if at the point of GPT-2, we had decided, hey, you know what, this is too dangerous, no one can have access, because we would have missed out on all of the past two or three years of incredible progress. And knowing when that moment will be or how to draw it feels to me like it's almost never going to be clear that you can say, okay, actually, this is too dangerous now. And so I'm generally in favor of finding ways to regulate end use cases and make the malicious use of the models be regulated and then punish that very strongly and make people responsible for the end outcomes than I am for banning the underlying technology. Though I, I, keep, I, I keep a door open to the possibility that we will reach a capabilities threshold where actually that's no longer a tenable position to hold, where the models are so powerful that actually you really don't want this to be in the hands of any random citizen in the world. I've heard arguments from people like Jeremy Howard who worry about centralization of power. So they say, you know, if the models are very dangerous, one of the strongest counter arguments, we don't want a small number of private companies or governments to be the only ones who have access to this. He cites the enlightenment arguments So, you know, during the enlightenment, people said lit you know, the ability to read is something that should be more widely distributed and that gives people power and is actually better for society. I think that there are flaws in those arguments when the models become particularly powerful, you know, when you would not want the average citizen to have the ability to create chemical weapons at home. You would not want the average citizen to be able to, and I'm not saying that LLMs allow them to do these things, but I'm just saying that the argument fails in a particular way. Like there is a capabilities threshold above which it is correct that we would want to restrict access. And to me, the challenge is knowing when that threshold is, and I would like to be very cautious in restricting open source usage ahead of that, because the evidence of the past few years would suggest that it's easy to do it too early. And I think we're still we're still figuring that out. Very, yeah, very cool. All right, well, it's been a, a really wonderful discussion. Maybe to close, what's next for you guys? Like the next six months or two years, what are you perhaps building? Where do you want to be? Where do you think, see things going? Yeah, so one is doubling down on the areas of strength we have today. So continuing to try and be the best player for both evaluation, for helping people when they're doing all of their collaborative prompt development and engineering, versioning, managing. But then once we've really nailed that down and have become the leader in that space, then I think sort of directions of travel, one is more proactivity. So today, a lot of these monitoring and observability tools are passive. They uh, do observation, they help you find bugs, help you correct them. But actually we're building AI tools. They can, be, they can do a lot more than that. They can actually start making suggestions. Hey, here's how you can reduce costs or here's how you might improve a particular version of a model. Proactivity will be a big part of it. I also think increasingly like the prize is trying to get agents to work reliably and as the models improve, I think that's still some way away, but better supporting people who are building agents will be something that becomes more and more important over time. In the short term, it's like really nailing our core competencies of being best in class at evaluation and having the best collaborative environment for prompt engineering, rolling that out to more and more companies because I think we are still at the early stage of the adoption curve there. And then I think within the next six months, moving on to more proactive versions of this, not that just passively monitoring, but are actually helping you make things better in an active way. Great. Where can people find you online, learn more about you, learn more about the company, follow your thoughts? Yeah. So for the company, I mean, humanloop.com is the website. There's docs there. You can sign up and try the product for free. There's case studies. That's probably the first place I would go to, to find out information. We're also active on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at Raz Razkol. And other than that, I've also done a few of these other podcasts. So if people are interested in finding out more about me personally or about the company history personally, there's, there's a good, good set of content out there. Great. Raza, thank you so much for doing this. 